Hello, hello, hello. I'm delighted today to be joined by Ariel Bernstein, who is a former IDF combat soldier who took part in the 2014 war in Gaza. He's now involved in campaigning, activism against the occupation and for peace generally. Ariel, it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm um, doing all right. Um, you know, in relation to what's going on, it's kind of difficult to say, but of course, day to day. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. It's an honor. It's an honor. And I know these are difficult times and these are difficult things to talk about, but we will, we will, um, this Let's is, give a, it a shot. yeah, yeah. Exactly. we'll give it a shot. And this is a, a very safe, comfortable space for you to speak. Um, just tell me firstly about your experiences then. You were a soldier back in 2014 and it was a very different kind of war conflict. This is on a whole new level. No question about that. Yeah. Um, but just tell me, just tell, just tell me, what's your kind of abiding memory from that experience? What was the key lessons you learned from that experience? Yeah, so I served between 2012 and 2015 in a reconnaissance unit called Sayeret Nachal. And um, I was, um, before entering, um, we had another operation that was quite large, but nobody remembers because what we call protective edge, Suketan, or the 2014 war kind of overshadowed the other operation that came before, which was called My Brother's Keeper, uh, in which we searched in the West Bank for the bodies, uh, what became known to be the bodies, but were kidnapped uh, teenagers. Um, and during those weeks of being in the West Bank, just to give you like kind of the, the mindset that I entered Gaza with, um, we were told we're searching for these teenagers, but we were also taking advantage of this moment where there is like public legitimacy to um, display power and, and, and um, more force in the West Bank. So we were basically searching for them, but also demonstrating our presence, our power, and also searching for any clue for anything suspicious, which is basically anything that you decide is suspicious. And um, so for weeks during this operation, I don't remember exactly how many days, I was a commander and I was choosing homes to enter and to invade and to, 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 to search, which basically means to enter a house in the middle of the night of a family, <laughs> flip all the furniture, terrify the family, not find anything usually because you're just choosing homes randomly and move on. When the idea is kind of, we uh, will display our force and then um, they will regret ever like basically fucking with us. Um, and doing these missions as a commander already started to really bother me. And I started to question the whole mission that we were doing. But then uh, Hamas started shooting rockets from Gaza and we are told that we're preparing for an invasion into Gaza. And I come with all these questions and a feeling that I'm not very motivated or not really believing in this kind of system that I'm serving. So entering Gaza was already something that was kind of uh, complicated for me um, because I wasn't sure I believe in it, you know, and what we're doing. Um, but I was so committed to uh, my teammates or my unit mates, uh, the guys that were serving with me, which are still good friends until today, even though I'm an anti-occupation activist, I felt like I don't really have the option to not go in. So entering already was kind of um, a complicated moment for me. Um, and every time there is a war in Gaza, we can speak more about what I saw and what I did and what I think about it. But every time there is an escalation, it's not like there was 2014 and now the 7th of October, 23. Every year in Israel, we have what we call a round around a violence which is a normalized way of calling basically aggression escalation war violence every time this happens which is quite often uh it brings me back to that moment where we crossed the fence into this place that we've never been into and we only heard scary things about uh where everybody inside are terrorists they want to kill you um so physically just to answer your question simply when i see these images it really has an effect on me every time there's an escalation. I mean, just that point about civilians, I suppose, because you said, you know, you were kind of what's driven into you, into your heads, is that these these are terrorists, all extremists. And we've heard 
I suppose from senior Israeli politicians talking about things like human animals, um, uh, that there were no innocents in Gaza, as the uh, former foreign minister, Avigor Lieberdun, um, puts it, for example. Um, the, uh, the Israeli president, I suppose, talking about collective guilt, that kind of stuff. I mean, you, you wrote in the Guardian article, really good, brilliant Guardian article you wrote, since the Israeli military had ordered civilians to leave the neighborhood, anyone who remained was, so we were told, a Hamas operative or supporter and therefore a legitimate target. I'm just right. interested in that because obviously in terms of the rules of war, that isn't how the rules of war work in terms of international law, Geneva conventions. But so I'm interested kind of what how that was expressed and and how that actually played out on the ground. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't really know exactly what the laws of war, international laws of war are. So it's hard for me to tell, especially even now as an activist, but especially as a soldier, you have no idea about those things. Of Nor course. do your commanders probably. Um, but there's a logic behind the logic behind uh, the way we fight in Gaza, uh, the way I experienced it, and I don't think it changed ever since, is that you tell... Uh, the residents of a certain neighborhood that you want to fight in or do you want to you want to conquer that you're coming in and they have to leave they have an x amount of time to leave so once you warn them uh in your eyes whoever stayed is either actively participating in the war as a hamas member or collaborating because we told them to leave so once you warn the population this area becomes a battleground it's not a neighborhood anymore at least in your eyes as a soldier you did your part or 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 you did what you needed to do to tell them to get away so if they stay um you know it's their fault and you don't really stop to think about that too much and uh most people don't also after they leave the army and for for many in israel that's even considered something that's too humane like why are we doing this when actually it's just a way of legitimizing the area to be a battleground it's not actually i don't think it's actually to help people um like save their lives um now going into to fighting in gaza compared to what i've experienced in the west bank is a completely different story um because we do this kind of we we, we uh, treat neighborhoods as battlegrounds and we treat it as as total war and we don't uh want to deal with civilian populations we don't make a difference whoever state is a legitimate target then we enter with much like uh, another level of engagement of firepower that I've ever seen. It's completely a different scale. Um, and there's this idea of um, we take zero risks on our own soldiers. So the way you enter is with very, very uh, heavy um, artillery and, uh, and um, bombings from, from above, from, from the sky. And this makes you feel much more confident as a soldier who's entering. Um, and it leaves a level of destruction that I've never experienced before in, in anything I did in the West Bank. Uh, another, another example for that could be the way we enter homes in Gaza. Um, before that, in the West Bank, you maybe invade a home. You're not really asking if you can enter or not. You maybe break the door. You maybe kick the door or do whatever you need to get in. Um, but in Gaza, you don't even go through the door because it might be trapped. So you fire a rocket um, from a shoulder rocket into the wall and you enter through the wall. So the way we're like engaging with this whole area is uh, completely different. Uh, we were there for like two weeks, I'd say maybe three. And as you're there, you start to see it, it's, it, it becomes more difficult to treat the place as if it's just a battleground because you're actually staying in people's homes. At least that's the way it was for me. You start seeing family photos, signs of life of people who live in this place, um, school books. We heard of a family that was uh, that what was that one of our units met in one of the homes, and they let her died in uh, the bombings from above, from um, fighter jets. Um, so this kind of idea that there is everybody is just um, who who stayed is engaged in fighting, and that we're in a battleground. It's hard to keep it um, when you actually see that you're in a neighborhood. And to your point, that has to do with the dehumanization. I think once you start to question that or to feel like that idea crack, then you have two options. Either you start questioning the whole thing that you're doing or you have to turn to uh, dehumanization because 
then if you don't do that, you're left with a lot of guilt, I believe. I mean, link to that. Do you think that IDF soldiers currently in Gaza have vengeance, I suppose, in their heads? And that vengeance has been maybe legitimized by, I suppose, those higher up in the army, but also uh, politicians. And when I say vengeance, it doesn't simply mean in their heads, say, identifying Hamas members, for example, but, but the risk is any civilian in Gaza could be on the receiving end of that vengeance. What's your sense of kind of how many IDF soldiers maybe are currently thinking right now and, and, and how sanctioned that might be? I think naturally, after seeing what happened on the 7th of October, people, not only soldiers, everybody in Israel might have this feeling that they want revenge. Maybe it wore down by now, but even I maybe felt it to a certain extent, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what's sad and what's different these days is that this kind of feeling and this desire for revenge and this idea that we don't need to make a difference between Hamas operatives and civilians isn't just something um, that you feel inside and you kind of want to feel and you might feel ashamed of it. It's completely normalized by the highest ranks, not only in uh, government, which is already really fucked up, but they're, I guess, trying to be populist and to, to, to ride this wave of hate. But also you can see this from within higher ranks in the army, which is really frightening. And I can definitely see how certain statements that used to be more considered kind of things that you're you're not supposed to say like we need to flatten out gaza there shouldn't be anybody left there after we finish this war or it's about time we finish them once and for all all kinds of statements like that have become something that are quite normal um around me sadly and they're they become normalized because of our leaders first of all you saw those images, as we've all seen, images, video footage of um, Palestinian men stripped nearly naked apart, down to their underpants um, and paraded in front of cameras. Um, I mean, a former British soldier made the point that um, removing clothes of people isn't in itself something which you wouldn't see in a military operation, check for suicide belts, belts things like that. Um, but doing mass arrests where people are stripped and then paraded in front of cameras obviously contravenes the Geneva Conventions. It's very clear that you can't do that according to international law. But what's your sense of when you saw those images and footage, there are also allegations that were obviously taken away and um, allegations of torture, that kind of thing. What What's your sense of what's happening there? What's yeah. how it's been justified and what the purpose is? Yeah, my sense is, first of all, there's no doubt that many people in Gaza are Part of Hamas, and they might even participate in what happened on the 7th of October. Um, it's not like uh, I know who is a terrorist and who isn't. I can't come here and tell you, oh, I know all of these people are innocent and none of them have done anything on the 7th. But I don't see any um, security, military um, logic behind parading people nakedly in front of cameras, like pe naked people in front of cameras in such a humiliating way. One thing that it makes me think is that this can only help Hamas more gain power because they have maybe an ideology in which they say all Zionists, all Israelis, all Jews are kind of monsters that it's impossible to speak with in any kind of dialogue. And we must fight and because we have no other option. So we have no one to speak with. And images like that really serve, I think, that narrative on Hamas's side. But what I think they do and their purpose is, is actually, it might be twofold. It might be one idea would be, and I think this is kind of something you hear a lot and in, 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 it is kind of like this, in a, it's a bit Orientalist logic mm -hmm. about the Middle East is that we, we need to talk to them in their language. You know, we need to stop being so humane as if we're like the most humane nation in all of history. And we need to start understanding that we're in the jungle and we need to play according to the jungle rules. So maybe something like that, according to that logic, is kind of showing them, oh, you messed with us. You really messed up this time, which has been proven mm. for years, for, from whenever I was alive, at least, that this never caused 
any more safety or security, only caused the opposite. It caused more escalation and more violence and more feeling that there's no safety. So I don't see how that logic works so far if we're speaking security, um, only from security eyes. But what I think the, the more, the deeper and maybe the real reason for these images is to serve the, the Israeli society. I think Israeli society needs to feel like we got back at them, mm -hmm. that we're causing them pain, that we're inflicting damage on them, that we're maybe even humiliating them. I'm not saying everybody, but I think that these kinds of images serve that desire for sure. And I think there is to, to actually uh, d do what the army or the, the, the countries, um, the leaders say they're going to they, their the, the goals are, which is to destroy Hamas and eliminate them. It seems like quite, um, I don't know if impossible, but it's, it's quite a really difficult mission that will include maybe losing the legitimacy internationally, which we already see, and, and maybe losing a lot of lives and soldiers, and maybe never really managing to completely fulfill that mission that seems kind of impossible, maybe to a certain extent. So I think that our leaders and the leadership are searching for uh, victory images. And, and, and I think that actions as like these, like humiliating photos, and destructions of huge uh, structures like universities and mosques and, and these kinds of uh, videos are, are there to serve that kind of desire for a victory image that an Israeli can sit in their, in their home and watch TV or be on, on, on the internet and feel like this desire for a victory image has mm. been fulfilled. But I think that's fake. You know, it's, it, it, it's a fake victory. It's a very shallow victory because where is it leading us? I don't think it's leading us anywhere. And I think it's, it's, it's also quite shameful that this is where we've gotten to, that we find joy and um, we, we, we find satisfaction in the humiliation uh, of others and destruction of others. Just a couple of other things. This is really fascinating, by the way. Um, in terms of the death toll, um, I mean, there's been attempts to muddy the waters in terms of what the actual death toll is um, because their health ministries are run by Hamas. But in previous conflicts, the final death toll issued by the health ministry has been validated by Israel and the United Nations and other aid agencies think it's correct. We had, uh, when Biden questioned the, the death toll, they released names, ages, and also Israel approved IDs because the civil registry is still run by Israel. Um, so we know it's accurate. Uh, and in fact, excludes people buried under the, the rubble. So actually, it's an underestimate. So it's about 20,000. I mean, that's that's a credible estimate, uh, which is about 1% of the population. And you keep seeing, one of those, I've never seen anything like it, where you log onto Twitter and you read of a journalist, a UN aid worker, and it just says they're, they've been killed. But then it it says 23 members of their family have also been killed. Yeah. Or 30. I mean, I've never seen anything like that in my life. What does that tell us about the military operation? Like what is actually happening? How that, because it is, it is an extremely rare, Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper did a study of this and, you know, there aren't really precedents for that kind of bombing campaign in a very small area of, of space, obviously. What, what's your sense of what's actually the dynamics of the military campaign? Well, it's hard to say exactly what's going on in the highest rooms, but I doubt that there is someone who's saying, oh, let's, um, you know, here's a bunch of civilians have done nothing, so let's just kill them. Because if that would be the case, we could have maybe killed more, you know? But that doesn't, that the fact that that isn't how it works doesn't mean that it's completely different. So I think the way, um, from what I know and what I've studied and heard um, as a researcher in Breaking the Silence is that, you have something called collateral damage, which means you have a military aim target. And then according to high, how important that target is, um, then you're, you allow yourself more collateral damage, which means innocent people uh, dying and maybe destruction of civilian infrastructure. Um, 
And when we see so many civilians are uninvolved, what we call the IDF called uninvolved um, deaths, I think it has to do with a growing tolerance towards collateral damage. Um, so if you have, so that means you have more targets, the targets might be less important and your collateral damage that you allow around it, which basically means innocent people dying becomes higher. Every war, every round of violence in Gaza, this kind of equation changes in which the target, we're more liberal, I think, with the way we um, allow collateral damage. And then you have to think about what it means a, a, a military target. Um, if there is a Hamas member who was verified to be in a certain building, I don't know exactly because I'm not the one choosing the, the targets, but that might make the whole building become a target, mm -hmm. right? So we need to think about what that means from the Israeli side, if we would think it would be justified, let's say, if a high-ranked Israeli officer or just an Israeli soldier walked into an apartment one time and had dinner um, or lived in a building, does that mean that everybody around becomes a legitimate yeah. target? Um, and I think as we dominate Palestinians more, especially in this way in which we do it in Gaza, I think as a people, we become, as a society, we become much more tolerant to deaths of civilians. And it's coming to a point right now where we, what we talked about before, where people actually claim that there is no such thing as an innocent person in Gaza. Mm -hmm. This is a gradual process that's reaching a peak, I hope, because <laughs> if, if this isn't the peak, then I don't want to know what the peak is. Just finally, kind of link to that, and just people might know, actually, I, I interviewed Yuval Abraham, who's a brilliant Israeli investigative journalist for the Israeli-Palestinian publication plus 972 magazine who went through many of the themes you just very articulately spoke about um just finally yeah dehumanization now i mean firstly look 7th of october is a huge trauma in israeli society it's traumatized israeli society quite understandably uh, so um obviously well we would agree there was a much there's a there's a that this didn't begin on 7th of october it goes back many many decades the context of occupation of siege um, and so on. Um, but the point that was just just that point about dehumanization and what occupations do to occupiers. And we were talking just before we, I put the video on um, about the experience of, of, for example, Britain and Ireland and, and the Irish were dehumanized in a in a way which I think lots of people who grew up um, in the 90s onwards don't actually often understand uh, because Irish culture suddenly became sexy, you know. Irish mm. music, that kind of thing. It was something kind of like a, that was not how Irish people were generally treated. They were treated off. They were portrayed as subhuman, um, mm. as innately brutish, as as violent, as uncivilized. Um, and that was a you know, and there was a famous um, way of summing this up in terms of the, even in the night that the nineteen fifties, sixties, of signs which would say no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Um, and I'm just interested because there was nothing unique in that sense about this. But I'm just interested in that dehumanization. What, how many Israeli citizens have come to see Palestinians, and whether that can ever shift, and and how, because that level of dehumanization is required to sustain this level of oppression and occupation. Because if you, as you said, when you start seeing those family photos and you see people as human beings, kids, all the rest of it, who have hopes and dreams and fears and who love and are loved, it becomes a lot harder to do terrible things to them. So yeah. I'm just wondering about that dehumanization and, and, yeah. and how you changed it. That was a very long question. I do apologize. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when I was a soldier in the Janine area guarding the fence, um, we uh, were patrolling the fence between the Janine area and Israel. Um, and it's this, like, what we call a smart fence, which when someone touches it, then you get an indication and then you go there with your Jeep. And one time we had this and there were two kids who were got to be, from my memory, at least like the maximum eight, maybe seven, eight year olds. And they touched the fence. I don't know what they were doing there. But our commander, our officer, he had this idea that they were maybe sent to touch the fence uh, in order to test how fast it takes us to get to that point. And therefore, in order to uh, 
kind of ruin their uh, idea or their scheme, we will arrest these kids so they know not to try to think about doing anything funny, you know. So basically, we had a reason why to arrest these kids for touching the fence. Um, and I was sent to arrest these two kids and put them in a military jeep and drive up to our base and put them in this little room and um, it made sense for a second. And then uh, I was holding these two kids, brothers maybe, or friends and closing the jeep and they were crying, terrified, holding each other and they were looking at me and they were terrified for me, you know, and I'm a good guy. Why, why, why would anybody be so terrified for me, a seven-year-old? And then I realized I'm kidnapping these kids. You know, there was some kind of military logic for a second there. Why? And, and, and then you see what you're doing. And then, as you said, when you're at that point, when you're armed and you're arresting these little kids, um, and you you don't want to feel nobody wants to feel like you're doing something bad so dehumanization in that moment could be really helpful you know so generally speaking as you said i think that the more you need to in, to control other people and controlling them through intimidation through putting their heads down through humiliation yeah you need to also it's it's more difficult to do that if you see their humanity for sure and I think this war really crystallized something for me. And I think it might be true for bo both sides. Not that I can speak about uh, the other side because I'm not Palestinian. But I think that there's this people, this narrative of there, it's either us or them. There's no space for both of us on this land. And there are a lot of people who believe that between the river and the sea. And it goes to our government and actually many of people in the opposition, but it's also true to the Hamas and the kind of ideology they serve. And once you believe that there's no space for both people to live peacefully in the land or at all, um, then you're, you have to turn to dehumanization because uh, it, either us or them means that one of us needs to be either exterminated mm -hmm. or transferred mm -hmm. out. And to accept that idea um, I think it's quite difficult. So I think, again, dehumanization is really helpful for um, holding on to that narrative, which is probably the majority of Israelis. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Um, and I think this is also what has been crystallized for me in these days as an activist, um, is that we have to crack that narrative. It seems so simple and maybe even like kumbaya-ish, like, oh, there's place for both nations on this land. But I believe that the, the narrative is so important because it also serves uh, Israeli violence and continuing the war. Because if there's really no space for both of us and it's, it's either Palestinians who can live on this land or Israelis, um, then this pushes Israelis to this corner where they feel more justified with their actions. Um, and... And obviously, op the opposite is true, too. So um, if you only believe that it's either us or them, then war is the only option. It's very it's very fertile land for war um, and dehumanization. So I, I believe that that is kind of something that has been that we need to put our our focus on right now. I think it's a very thought provoking way to end it. Um... Ariel, that was that was uh, absolutely fascinating and full of insight, but also humanity, which I'm always a big fan of. Um, humane insights into the horrors in which we live in. Um, and if there were more of it, we would not live in the world in which we live. So um, uh, please like and subscribe and do share this video. But a special thanks to Ariel for his brilliant, brilliant thoughts. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you for inviting me.